So I think this is actually working out perfectly. My talk is kind of a balance between the two. Um, and I'd like to start out by acknowledging that this was, work was done in collaboration with a number of people. Um, Ray Yu was the master's student at University of Washington that did uh, most of the work with advice from me and my colleague, Don Lehman, who's a professor at University of Washington, and then also Scott Campbell, who is a senior vice president of structures and codes with the National Ready Mix Association. People doing the work is, is important, but funding the work is actually also incredibly important. Okay, truth be told, most important. Um, so the funding for this came from the National Ready Mix Concrete Association as well, with some funding provided by NSF uh, through the NERI program as we used high performance computing resources that are available at TAC. And also consulted with um, committees 332 and 380 at various points. So what I want you to learn today is that I think there is a real opportunity for making reinforced concrete and FRC walls more competitive with other building materials in regions of low to moderate size in a city by reducing some of the requirements for reinforcement. Um, that limited laboratory testing and high resolution FEM shows that walls with much less than the current required reinforcement exhibit acceptable behavior and that FRC with low fiber contact can improve performance of these lightly reinforced concrete walls. And perhaps also that funding should be allocated for some laboratory testing to validate the FEM results that I'm gonna to show today. As I started to put this together, um, the question certainly came up of why investigate lightly reinforced concrete walls? And um, they're used quite regularly for low rise construction in regions of low and moderate seismicity. Um, lightly reinforced concrete walls with the insulated concrete form work have the potential to be highly competitive with other uh, building materials in particular because the ICF is not greatly increasing the insulation. Um, I also found some really interesting information as I was looking online in terms of uh, this largest passive house building in the world, which is entirely concrete con construction um, on the East Coast. So again, low to moderate seismicity. And this is actually two uh, reinforced concrete walls with a, a six inch layer of insulation between the two walls. And that's how this is built up to five or six stories. Um, and I guess what's also kind of nice about uh, reinforced concrete construction is there's the opportunity to do all sorts of creative things. Not quite as creative as the first talk, but in my world, almost as creative. <laughs> um, kind of going back to some of the technical issues that the current requirements for the, uh, wall reinforcement really do increase the, the cost of these concrete walls because um, the installation of the reinforcing steels is a, is a big cost of it. Um, but ultimately we're looking to show that lightly reinforced concrete walls can be a great uh, structural system. And uh, these are just some images of the ICF walls and kind of demonstrating what that system looks like. You probably all are pretty aware, but just I was really impressed as I uh, started working in this material because it's not something I've looked at in detail before. Oh my goodness, how tall these systems can be and just this opportunity for having that insulation in place as we start thinking about reducing, uh, increasing, increasing insulation, reducing energy uh, usage. So these are the current design requirements for RC walls. And the thing to take away from this is just that they are a lot more onerous than some of the other building materials. So we have a maximum spacing requirement of 18 inches, minimum longitudinal reinforcement, minimum transverse. And those are just substantially more onerous than say for masonry where spacing of the reinforcement for masonry might be 48 inches. Um, and these are, uh, these code requirements in terms of the 18 inch, uh, 18 inch spacings appear to be based more on slabs than they are thinking about walls for at a plane response. So research to answer some of these questions and address these issues. Uh, we're looking to investigate the potential for reducing the amount of reinforcement in these walls. Uh, in regions of low and moderate seismicity where we're talking about at a plane rather than in plane loading and to investigate the uh, opportunities for using FRC with really low fiber volumes. 
Um, this particular project was limited to finite element analysis, but we certainly went back and used experimental uh, data for some wall tests to validate the models. I'm going to talk about behavior of these systems, uh, looking primarily at some of the existing data, validation of our FEM model, application of that FEM model to investigate behavior of lightly reinforced concrete walls, and then expand out to using uh, walls that are not reinforced concrete, but FRC, and provide some recommendations for future work. We searched the literature pretty well. <laughs> I've been doing this for a while, <laughs> good at literature reviews. There's not a lot of data out there for lightly reinforced concrete walls. These roller tests from 96 are about the best thing that we found for out of plane loading of these walls. Uh, these were four point bend tests. So we've got supports, uh, two points of load application. And he looked at the full range of uh, design configurations. So there's reinforcement that space number four is at 32, number three is at 24, four is at 48, uh, and four is at 36, all different thicknesses. But the reinforcement ratios are ranging from uh, 0.06 up to 0.18%. So these are very low reinforcement ratios. If we look at the experimental data, these are normalized the moment applied in the maximum moment applied in the lab divided by the um, nominal flexural strength for these different walls. And you can see that essentially you get linear elastic behavior up to that fracture point, and then rapid deterioration as the crack propagates because it's almost one of those plain concrete beams we were just looking at. And then a pretty stable response that is just about the nominal flexural strength out to a really large drift of 6%. So you're getting this really nice stable response out here, even though it's cracked. Um, this green specimen did not do quite as well, and it's likely that there were just either some issues associated with forming that, or if you go back to this test setup, um, this is a, let's see, I believe it was described as less than ideal uh, loading and less than ideal boundary conditions. So I, there may have been some issues just associated with the load application as well. And as I move forward, I am not going to be presenting results out to 6% drift. Um, that's a quite excessive drift if you're thinking about the out of plane response to the wall. So most, oops, uh, the results that I'm going to be showing are really up to just 1% drift, which seems like a pretty reasonable cutoff point for us. So those were the data that we were looking at. Um, we also pulled some data for in-plane response of lightly reinforced concrete walls. I'm not gonna show that here. We've got a paper that should come out um, fairly soon. So those results will be there. It seems like the out of plane response is really what's the controlling factor for um, non-seismic uh, ranges. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the FEM software. When we were looking at it, our requirements were really that we could represent all these different aspects of the concrete behavior from uh, uh, representing the full tension response because these are governed by tension. Uh, steel yielding, since we saw some of those walls getting up to nominal strength, maybe some slip due to development of bond forces at the concrete steel interface, and then to a much lesser extent, concrete crushing, because you have to be way out there to start getting some concrete crushing controlling response. Um, with anything any type of simulation of reinforced concrete or plain concrete, having a very robust solution algorithm for your FEM model is incredibly important. The number of analyses that failed to converge, uh, I can no longer count in my career. Uh, the software that we're using actually has a dynamic explicit solution algorithm, so you don't have to worry about that. You just have to take lots of steps. Um, and we were also looking for software that it would allow us to use the um, NSF funded NERI facilities because that makes this high performance computing free to us, so to speak. We ultimately went with LS Dyna. I think for me, it was uh, this idea of having the dynamic explicit solution algorithm. It just means that you can progress taking little steps through those curves where you get a very uh, steep, stiff response followed by rapid strength loss. And it's very hard to do that if you're actually trying to do an iterative solution that converges on every point. So that was a, a primary factor for me. Plus the material models are excellent. Um, and additionally, uh, my 
my colleague, Professor uh, Lehman, her group has been using that to look at other reinforced concrete components. So there was lots of experience in at the University of Washington um, in the, the graduate student pool. So it gave our student um, some people to talk to about uh, details of the simulation. So here's our model of a uh, cross section of the wall and kind of looking down on it. We're exploiting the symmetry of this roller test. So I've got a symmetric boundary condition here, symmetric boundary condition here. Um, it just allows the simulations to go faster, fewer elements. Um, this is a basic, one of the sort of one of the one of the uh, tests or one of the um, test specimens. So here's three reinforcing bars in the uh, direction in which we're loading. Uh, one bar that is parallel to the direction of interest. Uh, pin support over here. Applied load over here. We're using for our concrete elements. These are all con constant strain elements um, with some hourglass control because of the single quadrature point. Uh, the maximum dimension of our elements is half an inch for all the models. So we've got some somewhere between seven to thirteen elements. It's a pretty coarse mesh, um, but we were. And you'll see a little bit of fluctuation in some of the results. We were really looking at this as a way of getting some basic understanding of it, not necessarily having really, really pretty uh, simulation results. Uh, reinforcing steel elements or beam elements to facilitate monitoring stresses. We could have easily have gone with truss. Uh, they're embedded in the concrete element, but they're embedded with a bond slip model uh, that essentially um, Allow, allow some deformation between the concrete and the steel. And I'm not gonna to talk too much about that here, but it was really interesting because, well, there's a couple of results that show some of the impact of the bond model. Um, I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly. There's a lot on concrete fracture energy. <laughs> so this is a plastic damage uh, concrete model. Uh, this is the compression curve over here uh, as, oops. As I said, compression is not really all that critical for these particular specimens. We're not really getting to the point where we're seeing a lot of inelastic action in compression. Uh, interestingly, it does use a fracture energy approach. We call it the crushing energy to do calibration of the softening response. Oh my goodness, keep hitting the softening response. And that allows you to uh, reduce the mesh sensitivity when you've got softening. That's in compression. And then when we go to uh, tension, you use the same approach. Uh, using the fracture energy to define the area under uh, the softening portion of the curve. So this is the, this is a plot of stress versus strain for tension. So this is the fracture energy divided by the element length. You can think about it in terms of displacement versus uh, um, stress versus displacement. Um, and I would just note that some models have a smooth curve. This has a bilinear curve. So there's a break point here and uh, we used a break the a break point definition that was recommended by some other researchers. Um, most of the calibration of this is just using, or all the calibration of this is using pretty standard material models, uh, ACI definition of elastic modulus, ACI definition of rupture strength, uh, the fracture energy we're taking from FIB, ACI doesn't have one uh, that's well-defined yet. Uh, crushing energy was a value that we had been using for some other simulations or calibrated for other simulations. The steel response, very, very simple. Everything I'm going to show you is monotonic. So the cyclic part is irrelevant. And then the bond model that we're using was developed by a um, group uh, when um, Marcia Delso was at UCSD. And we're probably only interested, this is showing bond stress on that surface of the steel bar versus slip of the bar with respect to the steel. And we probably are only interested in this portion of it. We're certainly not getting a bond failure in these uh, simulations. So these are our comparison of uh, simulation results with the experimental tests. And uh, I guess I would note that we do a reasonably good job of predicting what was observed in the lab. So here's one of those first tests. This has a row of uh, 0.2, we'll say. The red or the black is the measured response. You can see that it's pretty erratic and a uh, roller does attribute that to his less than ideal boundary conditions uh, and maybe also some less than ideal 
consolidation of the concrete. The red model is the simulation with bond. The blue is without, where you've got perfect bond between the concrete and the steel. You can see that modeling the bond response does mean that you pick up strength post cracking. So here's the crack point, it comes down, and then it's reaching the nominal strength over here. And with the bond model, you pick up strength more slowly than you do without the bond model where you've got perfect bond. So that's probably the big takeaway. The model does a reasonably good job of representing the experimental data. Um, we did some, you can see that there's a little bit of fluctuation and that's due to this dynamic explicit algorithm. Um, we did some mesh sensitivity studies and found that we were, uh, reasonably well converged at this mesh size. So we took away from this that, yeah, it was okay to use this to continue our investigation. Oh, and this is just showing what the damage pattern looks like. So this is a four point bend test. You've got a constant moment region over here and we're getting a region of cracking at that point, which is where you sort of enter that con the maximum moment or constant moment region. Uh, and this is basically just telling you everything that I just told you. So our conclusion was we could continue to use the software. So we went through and essentially did a parameter study to look at the out of plane response of some lightly reinforced walls. Uh, this is our reference specimen. It has one curtain of number four bars at 18 inches, so it's code compliant. It's 10 feet tall, almost 10 feet long. Um, F prime C is 4 KSI, FY is 60 KSI. It's got an axial load of 20% F prime CAG on it. Um, concrete elements are again a half an inch, so we've got 12 elements through the thickness. Um, some places we use larger elements just to reduce the, um, the time of the simulation. And there is uh, the bond equation used. And these are kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> it cracks at the bottom. <laughs> um, this is showing the crack surface or the front, the uh, damage pattern on the surface where cracking is occurring. This is a concrete damage parameter. I'm going to use that a lot throughout the sim, uh, this presentation. And the concrete damage parameter goes from zero, no cracking, the crack has informed to one when you've basically lost all of your tensile strength on the crack. And you can see that if you do a cross section, basically you get a concrete crack that's at the bottom that goes all the way through the wall to leaving just a little tiny compression region over here. You get a little teeny bit of crack initiation up and you can kind of see it better on this one. Um, this is showing our uh, a normalized uh, crack or normalized force essentially versus drift. These are normalized with respect to the cracking load, assuming uh, no axial stress. And uh, it was just a value that we use so that all of our um, results are consistent and we have a consistent uh, set of axes. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, we're getting a peak strength that is uh, larger than that value. And then it's dropping down and basically maintaining this residual post peak strength. These are some additional simulations that are showing using uh, larger rebar spacing. And so um, here's the results for rebar space at 18 inches, 24 inches, 36 inches, 48 inches. This one over here is indicating that there's just one plane of reinforcement. You can see that everything responds exactly the same up to peak load. You get a very slight difference in post-peak response. Uh, if you've got more steel, it starts to gain strength a little bit more quickly, less steel, more slowly. The results over here are for one and two curtains of reinforcing steel. So here's 48 inch spacing on the steel with one curtain, 48 inch spacing with two curtains. So you can see that the, I guess it's a little hard to see, the results of red, green, yellow, blue, these are the one curtain. And then when you add two curtains of steel, you get a much better, or you get more increase in strength. And eventually um, one could envision that this might actually somewhere out here start to start to reach the uh, cracking strength. Um, these are showing those, so those cuts through the system that show the amount of damage. So here is going from 18 inch spacing to 48 inch spacing, the damage patterns look 
identical. If I go from 48 inches spacing to, or with one curtain to two curtains, uh, the damage looks uh, actually absolutely the same at peak strength. And then when I go out at 1% drift, really this is having very little impact on the damage that we're seeing. Um, as you recall from the previous results, this one is stronger than this one out in that post cracking range because of the two curtains of steel. Uh, this is looking at the impact, I'm not quite sure what that's doing. Uh, this is looking at the impact of um, splicing. And so um, there are S and C is spliced or continuous. And so you can see when you look at a pair of walls, splicing the bar has relatively little impact uh, for the narrow spacing, a little bit more impact on the others. I thought what was most interesting was just the, the stress patterns that we were getting. So here's a spliced bar and here's a continuous bar at maximum strength. And you can see that the spliced bar is uh, showing less to some extent, the same stress or very similar stress at the, this is the, this is the foundation below the black line. This is the wall above the black line. Um, and this is at maximum stress. So you don't, or maximum strength. You don't see a lot of difference here. As you start moving out further, it's interesting to see how the splice bar is really sort of uh, having a, a more rapid drop off a region, a larger region of the bar that is at higher uh, stresses. And then this, bar that continues up into the wall just sees absolutely nothing. It's really just this bar that is embedded in the foundation that is carrying all the stress. And then above this point, as you recall, there's almost no cracking. And so there's no reason for that bar to pick up any load. And this spurred the idea of, well, maybe we could just talk about actually when we get to the fiber, just using fiber and then using what we called starter bars, where you have a fiber reinforced concrete wall and a starter bar that's maybe 18 inches into the foundation and 18 inches into the wall. Because when I look at this splice case, this blue, this bar here is just doing absolutely nothing. So summary. Um, Concrete tensile strength determines the peak strength. The models aren't reaching the ACI nominal strength. They're getting really close, but they're not reaching it at 1% drift. Um, models with two curtains of steel exhibit strain hardening, more, much more so than the one curtain of steel. Uh, one curtain of steel maintains uh, strength out to 1% drift. Tensile damage at the wall foundation interface, but not much uh, beyond that. And splices of the base have limited impact on response. I'm gonna skip through that. Okay, so that was reinforced concrete. Let's do FRC. So we're seeing <laughs> the strength of these walls is determined by the tensile strength of the concrete. Well, let's increase the tensile strength if we wanna increase the strength of these walls. So. Uh, that, so the FRC um, has the potential for increasing uh, strength of the wall overall, just because the FRC has much greater tensile strength. Um, because the damage is a single wide crack at the base, the FRC might also have the potential for improving performance by reducing that crack width because you're gonna get much more post, uh, you've got much more fracture energy, much more post crack toughness. And maybe we could also get some more distributed cracking up the height of the wall. Uh, we wanted to use really low volumes of hooked reinforcement. We want the stuff to be relatively easy to place. We don't need a lot of strength out of the concrete. We're just looking for a little bit of a little bit of an edge. Obviously, we want hooked fibers so that we're actually getting something out of the fiber if we're going to use low vol volumes. So we uh, developed a new concrete model. I shouldn't say that. We recal we calibrated our concrete model to represent the behavior of this FRC. And we uh, found some experimental data from a number of researchers that look at the uh, essentially the fracture energy of this FRC. And uh, there's some plots here from um, Markolikova was the the data set that we found to be most useful to us. So here's plain concrete in a black line. Uh, here's some green lines that are straight fiber. And then we were interested in these hooked fibers. And so here's some uh, lines showing the uh, idealized response of hook fibers. And then there's experimental data that characterize this uh, 
new gray area. So our new crush or fracture energy for FRC. Uh, so we took the Mar Markolikova data to get a uh, fracture energy for the FRC. And then we took uh, some simulations that Wu had done to get a, some recommendations on how to model this post-peak tension response. Because we're using the LS Dyna concrete model that just has a bilinear post-peak tension response, we ended up saying that this model here was essentially represented as something that was aligned down to the midpoint and then aligned down to zero. And so that was our uh, concrete uh, post-peak model for, for the FRC. But the area under here, this new GF fiber is much, much larger than the fracture energy for plain concrete. We did some initial uh, verification of the concrete model by just doing some simulations of the notch beam test that Markolikova did. And so here's the, we're trying to match the blue. Uh, these three blue lines are all experimental data for this, basically the same concrete. So there's a lot of variability in their experimental data. Our red line is our simulated response, which is doing a reasonably good job of representing that data. Okay, so on to our uh, parameter study with FRC. Uh, we're using three different fiber volumes. So uh, essentially increasing the strength and then also this fracture energy in the post-peak regime. Um, again, this is for hooked steel fibers. Because we weren't seeing a lot of variation between the uh, 18, 24, 36, 48, we're just using two bar spacings, one and two curtains of steel reinforcement. And then as I was talking about previously, this idea of using starter bars only just at the base. So here's a first set of simulation results. These are for 48 inch spacing, no fiber, half a percent, one percent, one and a half percent. Um, here's our uh, zero percent. You can see it's reaching up to about one and a half times our normalized uh, FCR and then maintaining strength out to one percent. When we add fiber, we get much, much more strength and get a much slower degradation of strength. So it's still losing strength out to one percent and we'll stabilize out here a bit. You can see that uh, this is at must be at maximum strength. And so at maximum strength, which is up here, you can see that there's already a little bit of cracking happening. And so at maximum strength with the FRC, you get some distributed cracking up the height of the wall. Whereas at maximum strength for the plain concrete, there's essentially no cracking. When we move on to, uh, I feel like I should have a, I guess, I thought there was an animation that would show what happens at peak strength. At peak strength, it looks pretty similar to this. It's just that this one out here is gonna have a much larger crack. These are gonna propagate out. Um, this is a rather intense plot, but I'm gonna talk about all these different variations that we did on these different uh, configurations. So let's start with, Okay, so let's start with looking at what happens with fiber. So these are 18 inch, I just chose 18 inch spacing, two curtains of steel, and then I'm going from, I'm going from uh, 0% to one and a half percent. So down here with uh, no fiber, you can see with two curtains of steel, I'm getting a little, uh, getting that little bit of hardening when I go up to a half a percent, much, much more strength. It's still softening out to uh, 1%, much, much more strength when I go to one, one and a half. So uh, more strength as I increase the fiber content, obviously more, much more peak strength as well. If we look at 18 versus uh, 48, so here's 48 inch, here's 18, no fiber. Here's uh, 48 inch, here's 18, here's 48 inch. So you can see that not much of an impact on peak strength regardless of fiber content, but increase in uh, post-peak strength when you've got, uh, um, when you're going from eight, or going from 48 inches to 18 inches. So the spacing has an impact out there. Um, looking at the 
starter bars only. So these are the ones that are the red line. So obviously not using them with the uh, plain concrete, but here's the starter bars. You can see that it just fits in with all the other data. Um, and these are at the three different levels of fiber. And so it's just ever so slightly, uh, actually on here, it's uh, just ever so slightly less than the uh, full bar, but almost indistinguishable. So the idea of using the FRC with just these starter bars seems like it would be worth uh, testing if nothing else. Now, as you start to get taller, that probably doesn't make as much sense, but I think it's just sort of emphasizing the idea that you don't need, <laughs> you don't need very much reinforcing steel in these walls that have fiber if you're just looking at relatively light loads and, the, and accepting the idea that once you get past this post peak, you just really want to be able to maintain the smaller crack widths and maintain a reasonable capacity. Um, this is kind of going back to those damage uh, parameters again, but um, observations, two curtains of steel and 18 inch spacing provides greater post peak uh, strength. So if I wanted to do anything, I might want to use two curtains at uh, 48 inches if I was really worried about um, getting some strength out of it because that one curtain in the middle is doing so much less than two. Um, maximum strength, drifted onset of strength loss and post-peak post strength increase with increasing fiber content. Starter bars only provide um, acceptable performance. Oh, and here's some more of those damage. I knew I'd put them in somewhere. Um, so this is at peak strength and this is at 1% out of plane. Um, you can see how there's almost no difference in the damage patterns depending on the fiber content. Um, with the fiber content, we're getting distributed cracking up the wall, whereas with the no fiber, we're essentially getting uh, no cracking up the wall and it's just this one crack at the base. This is kind of interesting in the sense that it's the stress field. Um, and this is the Z direction stress. So, uh, and these, this is maximum tension up to compression here. So, and this one is the no fiber and this is increasing fiber. So you can see that let's, I think uh, at peak strength, you can see you get um, from a sort of maximum tensile strength for the plain concrete out to a, a moderate compressive stress. So this is just a linear stress distribution. You've got a moment across the bottom, that's what you're expecting. Um, you can see a little bit of cracking mean, uh, along these or for these three where there's fiber, because as you recall, there's a little bit of nonlinear action in the fiber, a little bit of crack opening. Um, when you come down to this 1% at a plane where you've got substantial crack widths, you can see that you've dropped to almost no tensile strength in the plane concrete, but then you can see how this fiber is still carrying some tensile strength. And that's what's giving you that additional, uh, more, much more substantial flexural strength of these uh, fiber walls. So conclusions. Uh, I would be remiss as a researcher if I didn't tell you that the finite element modeling seems to do seems to be a good research tool, provides some really good understanding of the behavior. The simulation data show that the lightly reinforced concrete walls exhibit acceptable formants when constructed with lower reinforcements than are required by ACI. We're just seeing so little difference between the 18 and the 48 inch spacing that um, the 18 requirement really doesn't seem warranted. Uh, the FRC with low fiber volume offers the potential for substantially increased wall strength and deformation capacity, um, as well as much better control of cracking and this idea of potential for starter bars only. And that obviously this should be further investigated <laughs> and demonstrated with experimental testing. So with that, I will say thank you and show off rainy uh, cherry blossoms in Seattle. <laughs>